daughter and other one's getting married in December. And so I have kids your age and I'm sitting there thinking, gosh, how would I speak to my kids? Um, what would I share with them? And, and one of the benefits of being older is you see how things pan out years later, right? Those of us who are older in this room, there's like a couple of you, but you have the benefit of going, man, this seems so exciting. And then 20 years later going, oh, that was the fruit of that. That was the result of something I thought was so great. You just get to see the, the seasons. And there's something about having your grandchild and, and, and the daughter that you saw her born. And then now she's giving birth. And you, you just kind of see this flow. And meanwhile, as a pastor, and when you stay put, you know, at least I did for those 16 years, you, you just see life and you see people and you, and, and, and you see what happens depending on sometimes your actions. And um, let's be honest, this, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a tough week for me. I did not want to be here today. Um, on Wednesday, uh, one of my friends who helped me start the church 20 something years ago, 25 years ago. I was the best man in his wedding. He was one of my groomsmen. Um, LAPD guy. Uh, and on Wednesday, he, sh he killed himself. And you I'm there at the mortuary over his body just a couple days ago with his wife and kids. Uh, you know, when you live life long enough, you start seeing horrible things. And and you start to see how important depth is in a person. Um, and I think you mentioned like a, a shallow, surfacey um, type of Christianity that really isn't Christianity. Um, It wasn't too long ago that we had someone in our congregation here who left our congregation angry at the leadership. And then uh, months later, murders his grandmother, um, beheads her, believing there were demons inside of her. I, I just, you're seeing these deep, gross, demonic things happening and the enemy just getting a hold of people and then I look back at all the cool things we did as a church back in the day and the, back in the youth group to get people to come and thousands of people showing up and um What I want to say to you guys is just be so careful. You can get caught up in just the way things are done right now. Well, everyone does this, so we're going to do it. And, and you're old. You don't know how to reach this generation. And that, that's the way we all thought, even back then. Like... You know, like, like this is the way we're going to get the people in and we're going to get this celebrity to talk and we're going to get this person because he has so many followers and he's going to speak and that's really going to grab people's heart. If we get someone famous or we get someone brilliant, get this, 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 and let's do church this way because this will grab more people and get more people here. And, and we just didn't, we didn't, I didn't take the time to really look deeply in the word and not be tainted by the world and go, how did Jesus do it? What did he care about? What was most important to him? And to speak directly to people. 
You know, I, I was thinking how, how uh, two weeks ago I got a text from my buddy's wife. Said, you know, hey, can you talk to him? Something, something's going on. And then a text later, like, no, don't talk to him. I, he'll get mad if I say anything. And so I, I don't. And, you, you know, so I'm wrestling with all these things. Like, ah, oh, I should have just said, oh, I should have said this. And, and as I'm listening to you guys speak, and, 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 you know, as this is supposed to be about the future of the church, you know, it's just so much easier to kind of nuance everything just perfectly, just beautifully, and, and, and you know, keep your followers going and, and keep everyone happy with you and not be offensive. But then in, you end up in these situations where you go, why didn't I say something? I knew that guy. You know, I, I'm, I'm not talking about my buddy. I'm just thinking other situations where you knew something was wrong and why didn't you say something? Why don't you shoot straight? Uh, this is the generation that is obsessed with popularity. And you can't be popular and be a prophet. You can be a false prophet. I mean, Jesus says, woe to you when all men speak well of you, because that's how they treated the false prophets. But blessed are you when people hate you, you know? When they accuse you falsely, because that's the way they treat the prophet. We, we just got done reading the book of Jeremiah in our church. Read through the book of Jeremiah. Man, where he's just sitting there going, man, everyone, literally everyone hates me. Yet even in the church, we value people by the number of followers. Like You want to invite Jeremiah to this? You know, he didn't have any followers. And yet you read the things this guy had to say. And I read Jeremiah. That's one of my favorite books of the Bible now. I love it, the depth. And I say this because um, I believe very much that Jesus had a pattern um, of how he lived his life and how he dug deep in people's lives. He had people following him around 24 seven. Um, it was a life of sacrifice, it was a, lack, a life of suffering. Uh, he could have very easily been loved if he wasn't truthful. Um, when I look in this book, in fact, this year, as I read through the Bible every year, a whole church does, um, but I've been highlighting every time there's a, a verse about judgment, I'll highlight it in pink. And then every time there's a promise of blessing, I'll highlight it in blue. And as I'm going through the Bible and like two thirds through right now, there's a lot more pink than blue. And yet why is it that we rarely hear sermons about judgment? If over half the Bible is this, and I, one of the things I would challenge you guys to is how much of your speaking and teaching is on God's judgment and the difficult things to say. Because it's hard to gain a lot of followers if you say the difficult things. Um, I think these are some of the things we shy away from. We even try to make every funeral as beautiful. And every funeral you go to, oh, he's in a better place. Is that what you get from scripture? I was reading this morning. Uh, this morning's reading was from Ezra 5 and 6 and 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, he says, We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, 
for, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I, I just kept staring at this this morning because I was thinking, okay, he says, we, we refuse to practice cunning. Like, well, what does that mean? Like, he, he goes, man, I just refuse to, like, do you use this clever, sometimes that word could mean deceitful, but it's just, I, 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 I just refuse to do that. He says, instead, I'm not going to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of truth. He goes, I'm just going to say it. I'm not going to try to say it in the way that it's going to please you. I'm not going to, you know... Just wrap it up with this nice bow so that it's palatable to you. I'm just going to say it. Why? He says, because if you don't get it, it's because you're veiled. It's because you're blinded. And at least this is what the Bible says. He says, it's, it's because the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And so when we say, okay, how do you reach this millennial generation? We've got to do it in a millennial. No, it's just an open statement of truth. There's not a cunning way to do it. You just say it. And everything depends on what you were talking about, the prayer that's gone into this. How do you get the blinders off an unbeliever when it says the God of this world has blinded the mind of it to keep them from seeing it? It says later, it says, God who says let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Something supernatural, something miraculous happened where God himself, you can't do this. John 10, uh, I think it's 66-ish. Ah, is it that long of a book? Okay, uh, I might be wrong. It might be, it's John 10, I know that. Um, I'm gonna look it up. So I'm not making something up. It's not 66, there's no such thing. Is it 36? Nope. Okay, is it even John? No, it's John 6. That's why. Okay, sorry. I was like, John 10 is not that long. Um, John 6. That's not the verse either. <laughs> All right. Somewhere in the New Testament. Wait, one more, 63? Yes, ah, oh, good, okay, John 6, 63. Um, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Okay, Jesus says, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. Paul in 2 Corinthians says, look, I'm not going to try to use cunning to do this. I'm just going to lay it out because if you don't get it, it's because your, your heart is blinded by Satan and God needs to shine a light in there. There's nothing I can do by my speech. That's why, in fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 2, he says, I resolve to know nothing except the cross and him, and, and you know, except Christ and him crucified because I don't want to diminish the cross of its power. See, whenever we use cleverness, whenever we think we're going to reach this generation by doing this, 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 or some clever way, rather than prayer, fasting, and the word of God himself, and the Holy Spirit-filled person speaking, he says, then we're actually going to diminish. It's actually going to make it worse. Paul says, there's a way I can diminish the cross of its power, and that's when I rely on my own eloquence or superior wisdom. I think I have a way to reach this generation. And what I've learned over the years, it's the same thing that reaches every generation. X, Y, Z, it doesn't matter. It's the word of God. 
And the reason why they reject it is because they are literally blinded. And our battle is not against flesh and blood. And we could waste a lot of time coming up with and arguing about what's the best fleshly strategy. Um, and that's why I've been so passionate about the church and this oneness that needs to take place in this church. I mean, we're not, it's, and, and you know, earlier you mentioned, okay, he's in this house church reformation. It's, it's not that. I mean, it, you can have a crappy house church. It doesn't matter where you meet. It's about these principles of, of, of when we are together, what is it like? Are we, are, we, are we walking away deeply in love with Jesus, the person of Jesus? Are we truly deeply in love with one another? Because Jesus says, if we become perfectly one, he says, that'll work. If you become perfectly one, then the world will believe that I was sent by the Father, that I was loved by the Father, that you're loved by the Father. It's when you become perfectly one. And so we're just trying to gather together and go, okay, let's, let's make sure that, that we're, we're, we're falling deeply in love with him, deeply in love with one another, because he says that's what's going to reach. And the power is in this book, in this word. It isn't, it's not about a clever sermon, and so we rarely even have sermons. She's like, everyone is reading the word of God because we want them alone with God. We're fellowshipping over the word daily. That's so what I can tell you. Everyone read Ezra 5 and 6 today. Everyone read 2 Corinthians 4. So I can get together with anyone and go, man, what do you think about this? Like, man, have we been trying to be too clever? Is there kind of, you know, and, and look at the, the Ezra 5 and 6 today was insane. I mean, that's when, when King Darius takes over. You know, that's when they tell him you can't build the temple. And then suddenly, you know, the king saying, no, yeah, you can build the temple. In fact, we're going to pay for it. It's like, well, how does that stuff happen? Again, it's all supernatural. There's something else going on. I was struck a, a couple weeks ago when we we're reading the book of Job, and that's just that weird book. It is a weird book. You have the story of Satan talking to God, right? And God's going, hey, where you been? And he says, well, I was walking around the earth. He goes, did you see Job? He goes, yeah. You know, they're having this conversation up here, right? And so all these things start happening. And what do you have? You've got Job and his three friends. They're down on earth. And they're just going back and forth. Because these are like the wisest people on the earth, right? Those wisest people on the earth have no Clue. They're not even close. They're not even close to figuring it out. There's this real spiritual thing going on. This is the reality of what's going on. And they're talking down at this level going, well, I think it's this. No, I think it's this. And they're arguing with each other and they're all missing it. And God gets angry at them at the end. And I'm thinking, if they lived today, we would podcast them. They'd have so many followers, and yet they're all off. And I'm saying, God, I don't want to be one of those voices, God. I don't want to be one of those voices, and I have been. I've said a lot of things in confidence that were wrong. You know, as I was talking to these guys earlier before, you know, I was like, gosh, I remember... Uh, when I was young, they wouldn't let me talk. And that was so wise of them, you know? And uh, my youth pastor was like, yeah, you know what? I know you think you have a gift of teaching, but, uh, you know, go clean the toilets. Go, I mean, literally, clean the bathrooms after youth group. Uh, pick up the chairs, you know, stack them up, vacuum the place. All right, all right, all right. Eventually, it's like, okay, you can disciple the freshman guys. And I want you to treat them like they're your children and you just love them and you disciple them and you walk with them. And, you, you know, and I, I told them about how uh, I was at this conference, I was speaking and there was this other speaker that I really respected, this guy, Steve Farrar, and he had written this book called Point Man. And he heard me speak. He goes, you've got to write a book. 
you need to write a book. Can you send me, you know, stuff you've written? I was like, I haven't really written anything. He goes, well, these sermons you just gave, get, send me those. And I, I want to get you to a publisher. I want you to write. And so I send him all this stuff. I never hear back. And then I run into him a few years later and he's like, oh, hey, Francis. I'm like, hey. He goes, oh, you know what? I never got back to you. I go, yeah, I know. And uh, he goes, you know why? He goes, I found out your age. You're only 30? He goes, no one should write a book till they're 40. He goes, you're going to be embarrassed of what you wrote. And I thought, whoa, all right. And I didn't write Crazy Love till I was 40. I seriously waited because I thought there's, I'm just going to trust this older man. It's not what I think. I'm just going to trust this older guy. And I look back and go, oh, I'm so glad I didn't write anything back then. It's just, there, there's just, I don't know why I brought all of that up. I guess the, the whole point I'm, I'm, I'm just want to say, I, I just want to say is, I got caught up in a lot of stuff, the way people did church and went to church. And I just assumed, oh, well, everyone goes to a building and listens to a 40-minute sermon and sings for half an hour. Is that what I found in the Bible? Or is that just what everyone's doing? What do I find in the Bible? And again, I don't want you guys in your generation to be like, well, our generation, you know, everything's online. And so this is what we do. Okay. And you get caught up in that. And well, this is the way we influence people. And I'm just going, no, this is, this is the way. This is what the word of God says. There's some really simple things that are very difficult to do. Um, and it was all our cleverness that got us to where we are today, where people are far more excited about the next worship leader, the next speaker, and you rarely hear someone talking about being in the presence of Jesus himself and just shuddering and then crying and just going, this is amazing, Lord. Rarely do you hear people truly from their heart and, and you, where you can see it in their face, like where they go, I just want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I just want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I mean, for me to live is just this, this Christ. I want more of him, him, him. I don't hear people talking like that. Is because we found clever ways to do ministry. And honestly, then the people who discipled us, and we, it's great that you're talking about discipleship. The key is who's doing the discipling. Is it someone where you look at them and go, here is a guy that is deeply in love with Jesus. He loves, you can just tell. I mean, we can tell. You can tell when someone's in love with his wife. Right? Or he just talks and says the right things. You can tell when someone is obsessed with their child. Right? In the same way, you, you can tell when they're not so into their wives. You can tell when they're not really into their kids. As far as loving them, they may like what they do or this or that, but you, you can just, we know how to spot true love. And I'm going, when's the last time you just spotted someone? Go, he really loves the person of Jesus, like the person of God, like he can't get enough of him. Even with church leaders, we're not looking for that anymore. We, we want someone that can fill a room and, and, and has that gift of, of, you know, speaking or leadership or, or something to move this, drive this thing forward. And do we even think, is he a lover of Christ? Because he's going to be making disciples. We all make disciples, whether we try to or not. The question is, what kind of disciples are we making? As people see our example, what, what does it look like? That's my concern for this next generation is, I mean, some of you guys have a voice at a young age and You can argue that it's God-given, or you can argue that you pursued that. Um, 
a lot of people have a voice. And I would just say, be careful because there's a depth that takes time. It's like a foundation. And you can build this building bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But if that foundation wasn't cured and wasn't right, the bigger you build this building, the harder it's going to crash and the more people are going to fall. And I've seen this over and over and over again. That foundation of a person's character and depth of walk with the Lord and depth of humility was not there, yet they kept building, 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 building. And then when it falls, it takes a lot of people down with him. And so I would just say, man, I know you're living in a generation that's like get rich quick, get big quick, get famous quick. Um, I just don't see that in the scriptures. Uh, it takes time, it takes pain, uh, it takes failure, and and a big platform isn't always the best thing or the wise.